People yell on Halloween when they want shit. I'm not sure. <laughs> you guys help me with that, man? <laughs> That candy corn fucking hurts, doesn't it? We have more candy and more other things to throw at you. But first, first, I would like to introduce Fred again. who met his, his wife, Chrissy Marie, in the men's room. <laughs> and has such a sense of humor that despite being monstrously burned by gasoline at the age of 10, when he was forced to wear tissue stretchers, expanders, that made his neck look like a giant butt, he would put peanut butter or chocolate between the butt cheeks. <laughs> so he's got a sense of humor. The problem is, the big mistake, is that there are just a handful of his new book here tonight. And that book is The Heart Does Not Grow Back. I read it, I talked about it on the Tumblr blog. It's a great book. You'll be lucky if you find a copy tonight. So Fred Venturi. A big hand for Fred Venturi. I've never shit the bed. I don't want to disappoint you, but he said there's gonna be stories like that. I've never shit the bed, not once. Uh, you know, I bet a lot of you guys are like, I'm going to a reading tonight, and then you leave, and then your friends or family are probably saying, reading, one of those snooty, quiet, boring, shitty reading things, and look at this. The joke is on them, isn't it? Right? So I see the Joker's here tonight. Now, when the show's over, you can ask him how I got these scars. So tonight, it's the Better Than Sex Tour. I'm your foreplay tonight. I take this responsibility very seriously, okay? So I'm gonna read you a couple of things. I'm not gonna take too much time because I know you're here to see Chuck rock the house, right? So, uh, Sit back, relax, I'll try to be gentle. It's a Chuck show, there are no safe words. <laughs> and I totally mean that, I know Chuck fans. You get a Chuck fan in the sack, silk tie, silk scarf ain't gonna cut it. They're like, I want you to hit me as hard as you can, <laughs> right? So, we'll read you a story called The Meaning of Life. And don't look for the meaning of life in here. Just a spoiler alert there. She sits on the couch watching Dr. Phil, her legs half crossed. Her elbows hide her tits while she clicks red fingernails against her teeth. She's drawn in, all the delicious parts concealed, like she can resist me. A rope of snot dangles from my nose, threatening to drop onto the pages of my book. A deft rocking of my chin swings the snot onto my upper lip, where it sticks and begins a slow dribble towards my mouth. I notice, but I don't care. I like my parts. Snot and fingernails and scabs, they're pleasant to me, varying from fascinating to delicious. Everyone's tasted their own blood or caught a whiff of their own shit, but we want to experience everyone else with their crusts cut off. That's why this book, the big bloody encyclopedia of serial murder, is so interesting. Murderers love the crust of others as much as their own. I'm reading about the less than celebrated serial murderer, Edmund Kemper. A criminologist asked him what crossed his mind when a pretty girl crossed the street. Part of me would like to date her, he said. The other part wonders what her head would look like on a stick. 
The quote is falsely attributed to Ed Gein and Ted Bundy, Bundy because of his well-known cooperation with psychiatrists upon his capture, Gein because of his pop culture celebrity. She won't sit by me because I'm reading filth. Funny coming from her, I've seen her escapades in the bedroom, which can make even me blush. She quit her job as a hostess at Lone Star because it interfered with Oprah, back when Oprah was still on every day. She has a psychology degree, but quotes Dr. Phil, not Freud. She drives with two tires on the white line and won't park unless there's two consecutive empty spaces, but thinks she's a terrific driver. She'll eat frozen pizza, but not restaurant pizza, actually prefers Sprite over 7-Up, always jacks up the thermostat, and insists she's easy to please. I love the fuck out of her. There, she says, pointing at the television, the nipple shadows against her white t-shirt peeking when her arm lifts. I told Erica like three times, whenever a guy says he wants a break, just finish the phrase. It means break up. Who is she talking to? Me? The television? Herself? Rehearsing for what she'd say to someone who cares? People in love don't want breaks, she continues. They're addicted. They'll put up with anything. She needs to realize that Roy just isn't that into her if he wants to take a break. I should have TiVo'd this episode for her. I want to scream out, who the fuck are you talking to? But instead I say, I agree, then flip to the next page. Ed Gein's fame comes from one murder, not a spree, but he played with the skin. He built a chair from body parts and flesh. He wore his victim's face stitched together as a mask. He inspired Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Psycho, and countless other horror movies. For Christ's sakes, he has a fan club. What do you want for dinner, she asks. Whatever you're making, I say, wondering what Ed Gein might make. She scowls at me, but I'm not cooking. There's only 50 pages left. We'll order in if you don't want to cook, I tell her. I don't know, she says. Nothing's appealing to me right now, and eating out is costing us too much per month. Laziness has a price, I say. You call me lazy? No, we're lazy. We never want to cook. Well, I can't do it all the time, she says, then retreats to her television cocoon. John Wayne Gacy had a pile of dead children under his house. She's pregnant, but not showing. We can still have sex safely, from what I'm told. There's a pattern in this book. These guys are obsessed with sex. I'm obsessed with sex, but I'm not obsessed with killing people. Will the ending of this book reveal how one adds murder to their sexual obsession? Take her, for example. I have to keep the book over my boxers because she'll see my erection. I've been thinking of having sex with her since the last time we finished having sex. There's a bite mark on her left tit. I like to grab her by the back of the neck and jam her face into mine, just kiss the shit right out of her until our teeth clack. She's that puppy so cute, you're afraid of hugging it too hard, a kitten so adorable you want to drown it. Edmund Kemper cut one of his victims in half and had sex with the viscera. Cords of intestine wrapped around an erection, stomach tough as jerky, ripping open, the gelatin of chyme and blood and semen and half-digested microwave meals mixing together. Sound gross? Well, it's pretty damn close to actual sex. Just a slick membrane separ separates cock from gut, so a few millimeters is the difference between clean sex and humping innards. She's shaking her head now. Dr. Phil's over in 10 minutes. She's wondering if I'm gonna keep reading this shit instead of paying attention to her pouting. You have to stop, she says. I wonder if I might have been reading out loud. After gauging her expression, I decide that she's scared, but not terrified, so I dog ear my page. We're in the basement. The fluorescent lighting makes every pore in her skin a crater, but it makes reading easier. The walls are devoid of posters of pretty girls or sport fan-oriented bullshit. The couch she sits on is blue. My recliner in the corner is dirt gray. She calls this the college room, loves the TiVo, hates the cold, but sleeps well with no sunlight to wake her. Sheer panic ripples through me. Not because of where I am, but because I can remember no other details about the rest of the house. Do you love me, she asks. Does our kitchen have green or white linoleum? Absolutely, I say. I love you to the rafters. She huffs and begins clicking her nails again. I open up my book. But not enough to put the book down, she says, as I delve into a paragraph about Albert Fish, who liked to use rose stems as pipe cleaner for his pee hole. I can take sports or a little drinking or looking at other girls, maybe even gambling. I can understand those things, but this is just weird, bordering on creepy. It's just reading, I tell her and turn the page. Not when all of your reading focuses on one subject. That predicates a hobby, don't you think? Her and questions, everything's a question. When we argue, she answers with a baited question every fucking time. Things like, so you're saying it's my fault? So you don't love me? Why don't we make love? Why can't you make me feel special? Jesus, she should feel special. I don't fuck anyone else. Hobbies cost money, I say. Interests are free, it's just interesting. It's sick. 
You have a psychology degree, I tell her. You know the signs of a serial killer, animal abuse, pyromania, bedwetting, a fractured childhood. I only have a morbid curiosity, none of those signs. There's something to decode from their mindset, though. Do you know how intelligent, motivated, and clear these people are? Like they know a secret no one else does? So you're modeling your mindset after serial killers? Like clockwork she is. Do you know what the meaning of life is, I ask? Let's see how she likes her own question-oriented medicine. Why don't you enlighten me, Socrates? The year before I met you, I say, staring at her tits while looking contemplative, I took a philosophy elective. That was a question we had to answer on the first day. I took the simple approach. The meaning of life is to be happy. And Bob, our teacher, asked if a serial killer led a happy life. And you said yes, she says. Not a question, but an interruption. I did. I think they're among the happiest people on the planet. They do something they love until it's their eventual undoing. If someone dedicates their life to piano playing, then dies at the piano after creating their masterpiece, we marvel at the dedication and the drive. We call it their purpose, not their addiction, not a sickness. Why not at least try to look for positive pieces in the wake of a killer? There's a benefit to their thinking. Quite simply, shut up, she says. Piano players don't hurt anyone. Just stop, just shut the fuck up. Not a bad idea. I could talk forever, but I've already constructed my escape hatch for this mini argument. The tension drains from my face. The eyebrows slacken and the corners of my mouth rise slightly. This is my look of self-reproach. I throw the book into the trash can but I make sure to dog ear my page first. You make me so happy, I say. I sit beside her, my arm lassoing her by the waist. She gives me her shoulder, looking away. Heat radiates from her back. I reach behind her ear, smoothing that brown hair. I've sucked that hair. It tastes exactly like hair. <laughs> I'm dedicating my life to you. You are the meaning of my life, and this relationship, this, is our masterpiece. And I never do anything to desecrate something so important to me so sacred. Sounds poetic, doesn't it? Dennis Nilsson wrote a slew of verse about the men he strangled, dismembered, and flushed down the toilet. Covered in your tomato paste, a man of many parts, I try to forget. Then I massage her shoulders. She turns to me, tears dribbling off her chin. She snaps up a tissue and wipes my long neglected nose. You don't have to cry, she says. I've just, it's the baby, mood swings, you know? Her skin reminds me of a button-up silk shirt from high school. The fabric was so exotic and fragile, I was afraid to wash the shirt, so I never wore it. Not once, but it was my favorite shirt. Her eyes are a faded green like that weird winter green rubbing alcohol. She shuts them during sex. I know because I watch to see if she's faking. I kiss her, hard as usual, and she kisses back, but her hands are loose on my arms. She wants to be held. She wants the purity of kissing without going any further. She initially resists when I start fumbling around the waistband of her jeans, looking to push them down, but she finally relents and says, I love you. I love her too. She knows it. You can't fake love. That's why I'm so scared. We've been married for six years. We're gonna welcome our child into this world soon, but dear God, I can't stop thinking about what her head would look like on a stick. <laughs> We started with the usual chatter about female conquests, only this timeline had a purpose. Since the trail of girls was taking them away from Carbondale, crossing state lines, heading west, and ending in California, his tone brightened when he talked about the reality television show called Dedications. There's this girl, Lori, fake tits, real hot. Sort of been dating since March, or at least she's under that impression. So anyway, I applied for that show and I ended up getting a call. I'm like, okay, there's a shot here. After an interview and a few follow-ups, made the cut, dude. Puckers want Mac Tucker on TV. Ah, the dream of fame. The fastball was dead, but the dream wasn't. I hate to be a buzzkill, but it sounds like you're not doing the college thing anymore. The casting interview was during exam week, all right? I can get a college credits any fucking time. <laughs> then good for you, I said. Good for us, man. Convertible trip to California, brother. I haven't forgotten. There's like one tiny complication with the casting. They want me to propose to her on the show. Dude, I know you don't want to get married, I said. And you've only dated Lori for what, like 10 weeks? Two and a half months, fuck nuts. It's a relationship, not a newborn. But they won't let me on the show if I don't propose. It's kind of the point of the show, but don't worry, I got this figured out. She won't say yes. It'll be their signature episode where I get rejected. 
I can do autograph signings in malls, maybe get some momentum for a bachelor show of some sort, you know? Chicks will feel sorry for me. Pity pussy galore. I could tell he never actually watched the show, which was buried on a shitty cable network that only a guy with a life like mine would run into. But the women always said yes. A typical episode consisted of some tool hell-bent on getting married, spewing his story to a big music star during the first segment. In the second segment, the star and the tool sit in a studio, and the music star writes a song specifically for that tool's one and only love. In the last segment, the one and only love, who's usually a gorgeous woman who had no business being with that tool, got dragged into a restaurant or a park significant to the relationship so that the music star could emerge and perform that custom song as the tool holds her hand and tears in his eyes as he proposes. So you think she'll say no, I ask? You think any woman who can, can say no when she knows she's on TV and being judged by a whole audience? When she has a song from a famous sexy pop star written and performed just for her? You're right, he said. Good, good thing for me, my episode won't have anyone sexy or famous. I don't even know the guy's name, Ben McSomething, some black dude who plays the piano and, is, and he isn't even blind. How good could he be? Anyway, this special occasion, man, they really seem fucking A-pleased with what I bring to the table, so this is the launch pad. I'm thinking me, you, steakhouse, a few pictures. You in? Maybe, I said. What are you doing nowadays anyway? Well, I didn't want to say nothing. I got a few irons in the fire. Atta boy. That mean you're picking up the check or what? Yeah, I said without thinking. I wasn't in a check-picking-up state when it came to finances, but I didn't want to tip my hand to Mac. Good! I should come through your way early next week. That cool? I'll just holler. My thought was, come through on your way to where? He sounded adrift, but that made two of us. Just holler, I said. No interest in shit going on in my world. He screamed, Mustang, motherfucker, and hung up the phone. And I have one last page I'll leave you with very quickly, and then we can get to the party. Obviously, I turned pages, so things happen. <laughs> if you read it, maybe you'll figure out what that was. So, the page I'll leave you with today. I went back to my motel and set up the camera. I switched it on and took my place on the bed where the brand new bypass loppers rested. Those big ass garden shears that can effort effortlessly cut through a two inch tree limb with disturbing ease. The sticker was still on the handle, with the jaw of the blade still oiled and tight. Reluctantly, Doc had given me a syringe full of lidocaine. I jabbed the needle in the flesh between my metatarsal bones on the top of my foot. A cool, sufficient numbness spilled into my toes and I pressed record. Mac, I'm not sure how your dedications experience is going, but tell your producers you have an idea for a show. One man gives away his organs to needy families. The same guy, because his organs keep growing back. I know you believe me, I held up my right hand. Tell them what happened to my hand, what it looks like now, what my ear looks like now, but just in case, I figured I'd show you this. I took the bypass loppers and raised my foot into the frame. I put the jaws snugly against my second toe and snapped the loppers shut. My toe popped into the air, then fell into the dirt smudge motel carpet. Thanks to the lidocaine, I didn't even wince. I'm on my way to Los Angeles, I continued. This tape will beat me there in the mail, but the next time you see me, this toe will have already grown back. And you know it's real because I don't have a special effects budget. And if you don't believe it, I can do it again and again and again until you or anyone else has no choice but to believe it. I turned off the camera, then jotted, watch this as soon as you can on a piece of paper. Signed it and dropped it into an envelope along with the camera's memory card. I addressed it to Mac Tucker, care of the Dedications Production Company. I threw the envelope into the mailbox on my way out of town. I walked west, actually limped west, with $80 in my pocket and no intention of ever coming back. I just want to thank you guys. This was great. Uh, the best is yet to come tonight. And this is a live mic. It's New York. So I got to say, Baba Booey.